Welcome back to the exchange with more universities shifting to online classes only. Demand for student housing is falling, and that is leading to a growing number of housing defaults. Seema Modi is here with more for us. Seema? Kelly, typically in mid-August, students are starting to move into their dorms and make last-minute trips to Ikea to outfit their rooms. But with nearly half of U.S. universities expected to pivot to online, learning uh, student housing projects could face a decline in occupancy. Green Street Advisor says UNC Chapel Hill's decision to go virtual suggests the risk of lease cancellations, no-shows, and refund requests for off-campus apartments is growing. And with fewer students coming to the campus, student housing projects could have a tough time servicing municipal debt that they have taken out to fund those projects. We've already seen a number of defaults in properties near Oklahoma University, College of New Rochelle in Westchester, and Howard University in D.C. The student housing, student housing REIT, American Campus, currently on track for its worst year since 2004, currently down over 30 percent. And it's worth noting, higher education and is one of the sectors credit rating agency S&P has assigned the highest number of negative outlooks, uh, second only to transportation. So, Kelly, investors are certainly taking notice of this trend. Yeah, you know, you've been all over this with the American, uh, with the ACC REIT, SEMA, and now a raft of defaults. We appreciate it. We'll talk more about this now. I'm joined by Randy Girardi. He is director and head of municipal strategy at Wells Fargo Securities. Randy, it's good to have you. Where, how do the dominoes continue to fall here? What do investors need to know and watch for? Sure. Thanks for having me, Kelly. So we, we were already cautious, as was mentioned earlier, with the higher ed space coming into uh, 2020. Uh, we certainly think the movement to online uh, activities and moving to online learning, the hybrid model certainly has negative ramifications for student housing, as mentioned. We think there are three things people need to focus on. Location, location, location. Uh, where these facilities are located, being on campus versus off campus, uh, having uh, new amenities would be the second thing to focus on, and the ability to uh, reach student uh, interest in changing preferences especially, uh, you know, not sharing uh, dorms, for example, uh, showering that has a bit more privacy, et cetera, in this new age of COVID-19. Sure. So what, you know, I'm curious, I'm going to ask you about this from the college point of view, even though you're the investing guy, but what happens once colleges default on these payments? I mean, presumably they want students to come back and fill those properties in the future. Sure. So one thing about municipal finance, uh, you know, usually, uh, you know, you, you see a, 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 a ability to continue to move forward as an institution. Uh, so while these projects may have uh, have challenges, we think that the universities will largely uh, remain intact. And so I think uh, if they can, you know, develop a situation where they downsize their inventories, uh, they can make their uh, their portfolio of real estate a bit more palatable to their students' uh, structure. Uh, we think that you know there is an opportunity for investors to uh, you know continue to invest in the sector, and recoveries uh, you know may be able to be gained if we can just get through this COVID nineteen patch uh, and get to a more uh, adjusted uh, learning structure where you have a hybrid and a traditional model together. Work. Right, because I guess the question comes down to, as an investor, do you think colleges are going back to normal before COVID, or do you think this will represent some kind of permanent shift, not just because of the pandemic, but because of all the trends and forces that were building up against the proliferation of all these colleges and universities prior to this? What's your guess about how that shakes out? Sure. I mean, I think I think we, you know, small liberal arts universities that are, uh, you know, in a highly competitive market with students that were already the demographics were moving against colleges and universities, just the number of student age, uh, you know, cohorts uh, coming through the system. So, I mean, we think that there are certainly uh, you know chances that you are going to have uh, private universities in particular shutting down. But even beyond that, you know, you look at the state and local picture, uh, these large state universities, uh, they also, you look to states for uh, aid. And we think, you know, given the, uh, sh the challenges at the state and local government level, we think uh, student aid is going to also be pressured. So they're really feeling it on both ends uh, in terms of, uh, of, the, of the push on the business model. And that was happening before COVID-19. We think that just, this just accelerates the, uh, that trend. And, and there will be winners and losers for sure. Um, you know, we think that there needs to be an adjustment uh, to, the, to the overall um, you know, yeah. the market. So we have talked a lot about the losers, the candidates we're starting to see already. Give me a name or two or a, a way to invest that, you know, on, on who might be a winner here. Sure. I mean, we think that the up quality trade makes sense here. Uh, the universities that have strong endowments, uh, the universities that have, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, an Ivy League or a top tier uh, state school, that's certainly going to continue to have value. Where we're most concerned is, uh, you know, small small liberal arts universities that have engaged in some speculative products for growth that they 
thought would happen, and that's certainly curtailed. So we, we think higher education still offers a decent value proposition, but again, we think the market needs to be right-sized, and we don't think that uh, investors are fully being compensated for this risk in the municipal market, given the strong technical environment that we're cur currently seeing in our marketplace. Yeah, we haven't even gotten into your other specialty and experience uh, in stadium finance. Maybe we can do that another time. Uh, but Randy, it's been good to have you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Look forward to catching up one other time again. Randy Girardi's from Wells Fargo. Sticking with education, at a time when tech is critical to schools as they shift to online learning, the trade war is having some unintended consequences for students. Elon Moy is here with more on that. Elon. Well, Kelly, this story takes you all the way from the Muslim Uyghurs in the far west region of China to students here in America who are dealing with distance learning. It all started over the summer when Chinese company Bitland got blacklisted over human rights violations related to the Uyghurs. Now, Bitland is a supplier to Lenovo. It makes parts for its popular Chromebook laptops. And so these sanctions ended up colliding with a crush of orders from school districts who were trying to gear up for virtual learning. Now these districts are telling us that their orders are getting seized during shipment, and it could take weeks or even months for them to be replaced. One district in Missouri told us it had 645 laptops that were seized. In Indianapolis, another district says it's waiting on 3,700 laptops. And in Denver, as many as 12,500 laptops could get hit. Now, Kelly, we did reach out to Lenovo for comment. They did not respond. But the schools tell us the company is working with a new supplier and hoping to get them laptops soon. I Back mean, over to you've you. probably experienced this as well, Elon, the, the scramble for any kind of laptop or computer. These And now there's people who are learning just now their kids might need more laptops. That's exactly right. You know, there are 7 million students who do not have a device at home to use for virtual learning. So the real concern here is equity. You know, how many kids are not going to be able to complete the schoolwork that they need to do because they simply don't have the technology available to them. That's creating a huge backlog both on the parents' end and on the school district's end to ensure that there is that one-to-one -one ratio for devices. Yeah. yeah, I have had a laptop sitting around for five years. I'm not really using it. I'm I wonder if I'm not the only one. It's time to go wipe it clean, you know, get it into the right hand somewhere. Elon, thanks very much. Elon Moy, fascinating details there. Well, today's Crowded King is a household name and the fourth best S&P performer since March. We will reveal that stock next. Quick programming note before we go, National Economic Council Director Larry Kudlow will be on Closing Bell today at 3 p.m. Eastern time. You won't want to miss it. Muni Money is sponsored by BAM. Ask your investment advisor about BAM-insured Muni bonds. When the market is unpredictable, BAM gives you certainty. In the face of market volatility and illiquidity, BAM-insured municipal bonds deliver default protection, value preservation, and a durable rating. BAM. Build America Mutual.